invited guests to the plenary session of Engineering Fact. We are Admiral Virajji Nagarpur, Director General of Electrical and Electronic Sri Lanka Navy, Retired Captain Nagarpur Singha, Child Engineer Form CEO of Naval Dockyard Sri Lanka Navy, Dr. Indrajit D. Nisanka, Senior Lecturer, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University of Monto Sri Lanka, Engineer Nesli Hema Chandra, Chief Examiner of Engineers, Ministry of Sports and Aviation, Sri Lanka. The plenary speakers for today, academic, academic supporting, non-academic staff and students present here today with us. We want to welcome you all to the plenary session in engineering track of the 16th International Research Conference of General Surgeon Kukulabu Defense University. The main theme of the research conference is achieving resilience through digitalization, sustainability, and sectoral transformation, whereas the theme for the plenary session is innovative engineering solutions for digitalization and sustainable development. This session will be chaired by Professor J.B. Ekanayaka, while the rapporteur will be Engineer Sumal Nurmudia. We call you invite the chair and the rapporteur to their respective table. In today's session, we have four plenary speakers. Professor Jonathan Richard Wings, Defence Science and Technology Group, Department of Defence Australia. Dr. Tusita Sudhapala, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, University of Monitor, Sri Lanka. Dr. Henry Thru, Planetary Science Division, NASA HQ, United States. And Engineer Saurabha Kumar Baru, Project Manager, Ceylon University Board, Sri Lanka. We also invite all the plenary speakers to the head of the table. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to introduce the chairperson of this session, Professor J.P. Ekanaka. He is a distinguished authority in smart grid and renewable energy integration. He earned his BSc with first class honors in electrical engineering from the University of Ferrara in Sri Lanka in 1990 and a PhD from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, UK. As a fellow member of IEEE USA since 2017 and IESL Sri Lanka in 2013, his expertise and leadership in the field are widely acknowledged. With a career span, and global projects, Professor Ekanayaka has held significant roles at the University of Pera, including two terms as the head of the department. He is a visiting professor at Cardiff University, UK, and at Unitan, Malaysia. He is also an honorary professor at the University of Wollongong, Australia. His global impact is evident through contributions to projects like the Green Power Generation Project in Manor, Sri Lanka, and the Green Power Development Program in Vietnam. Additionally, he is a prolific author who has co-authored eight books and contributed to over 100 papers in refereed journals and serves on the editorial boards of respected journals. Professor Ekanayaka's engineering dedication to smart grid, renewable energy, and electrical engineering has left an indelible mark on the industry, inspiring innovation and sustainability worldwide. We cordially invite Professor J.P. Ekanayaka to commence the session. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for introduction. Uh, so, today we are having this session on the theme uh, are very familiar to everybody, uh, so I think the KDU has picked the right team to start with. And I was amazed to see when we went into for sustainability, we always think about uh, carbon dioxide emissions, the global warming, that kind of stuff. But today we have an interesting uh, speech by Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Henry Crew talking the sustainability in a completely different way, whether the planet will sustain. 
it does come to the, the level of planning that goes into <coughs> maritime strategies, which is it's quite phenomenal. So I, I've been working in maritime engineering for some time, and uh, I was working in Australia in the, the 2015 in defence, and then we had a defence white paper in 2016 also in Australia, and that suddenly mapped out 30 years of shipbuilding and the amount of interest that that generated was amazing. Even though all it was was a, a plan, a plan for a plan almost. Um, but it's that level of commitment, that the 30 years, 50 years commitment, that does mean that we can actually and must indeed put a, a good amount of research in, but a, as much research as we possibly can. So what I did do in preparing for this talk was uh, revise up by not only the Australian naval shipbuilding um, context, but I did manage to find uh, this one here. So Australian naval shipbuilding plan from 2017. I know that pretty much inside out there. It doesn't take long to look up on the internet and you can find all kinds of naval shipbuilding <coughs> plans in all kinds of different uh, countries. Uh, the French, the US, of course, the US updates it pretty much every year through Congress. Uh, the UK, naval shipbuilding plan governments, and then Sri Lanka's uh, National Maritime Strategy as well. These are all very, very long, far reaching plans for making sure that we've got the right navies in the right places at the right times. And that requires a large amount of engineering, a large amount of shipbuilding shipbuilding has a substantial and long-term investment across all these nations, which means that we can invest research and indeed we, we perhaps must invest research. Where do these plans all come from? Um, again, I can, I can speak very authoritatively from the Australian perspective, I suppose, because I've studied it quite, quite substantially over the front of the years, trying to figure out why we're doing what we're doing. And the Australian uh, research uh, strategic plans uh, get updated regularly. This is a slide I borrowed from a colleague of mine and defense uh, strategic updates in 2020, uh, force structure plans, uh, defense transformation strategies. There's, there's a lot of different strategies and, and plans forward. And they all set the pace for these naval shipbuilding plans. It's, it's not just a, a matter of trying to build boats for the sake of building boats. It's all going to do very, very specific operation at very, very specific times. These are all the whole of the government, whole of the nation efforts perhaps here. So we, again, we, we must make sure we're doing some research in these areas to make sure we invest in it. Why do the maritime research? Well, firstly, we've got to raise the technology ready to service. Um, some of the research that you'll hear about, of course, is that what we call technology ready to enable the TRL might not be right at that stage where you can actually deploy them into a, a working vessel and make sure that they're actually performing the way they want to be performing. So a lot of my research over the years has actually been simply raising the technology readiness level of particular technologies out there to make sure that they are deployable, they are doing what we need them to do. And finally, um, what we've talked about here, technology for warfighter, for the end user, as quickly as possible. That, would, that comes into play for any any piece of research, the impact is, is the most important of all. And it's exactly how we do that impact, how we translate that impact through to the end user, does actually cross across all the sectors. So what sectors do we need to do research? Again, what I've done is simply refer to a whole range of uh, internet searches, uh, not generating knowledge, but certainly establishing what sort of knowledge there is out there. And it's, it's pretty quick to, to realize that every single nation has some kind of what we might call a strategic capability accelerator. Um, to get the impact, many nations have set up innovation capacity, capability accelerators. Uh, I suppose the, the classic one might be from the US there. Um, this one, DARPA, the very top one, defense. Advanced Research Agency has been going on for, for quite some time now, um, and that's sponsored projects all around the world. In fact, we've had projects sponsored by the various countries. Um, these other nations all have innovation agencies. The latest one, perhaps, are the Australian, in the Australian context, we've actually integrated one called the Australian Strategic Capability Accelerator, ASCA, has just started, in fact, um, my next boss is starting with it. Um, it used to be the Defence Innovation Hub and the next um, essentially though, it's, it's bringing together all the different aspects and so what do they do? So again, this is another slide from one of my colleagues about ASCA from an Australian context. 
the priorities are definitely determined by defence and defence industries. The official based model co-develops with defence end users, funded programs, specific and time limited to make sure that we do actually get that impact, it's not going to be constantly churning away. But that last one there, Australian industry, universities and defence. Um, essentially all these points here, that um, collaboration between so DSTD, Defence Science Technology Group, uh, DNTC is the Defence Materials Technology Centre, that's a materials uh, research, property research centre that brought together industry and academia. So those are the two government bodies, but then we brought together six industry partners. So um, Serco is a very large service, it's called the Service Company, um, they do all kinds of things, a UK company. They run a lot of vessels within Australia. Uh, they do actually, they, they took over a group in Australia that does a lot of um, uh, builders as well, called DMS Maritime. So they, they, they broke the builders the, the new Moina, the Australian icebreaker vessel. Um, they broke the builders of a, a range of different vessels. So it's quite a large um, consulting engineering company. Uh, Thales, that's a French company in Australia, they do a lot of acoustics, where all of our acoustics devices come from Thales. Uh, <coughs> that's obviously a UK engineering company. Pacific uh, Marine Batteries, they build all the batteries for, for the Australian Navy. Hostel is a uh, ship builder in Australia, down in the west, in Perth. They build large catamaran and also some control boats, or quite a few control boats as well. And then we brought together three different universities. Uh, Flinders University, Australian Maritime College through the University of Tasmania and the University of Auburn are mixed bringing together unique areas. Um, what we were able to do with those uh, six companies, two, <coughs> two uh, government organisations and three universities was to set up nine PhDs and four postdocs. They were the, the PhDs in early career research. Um, the key point here was actually getting industry involved right from day one. So, <coughs> because we're all in the defence industries, we could all talk at a reasonable sort of level um, and understand all the problems that we're going to go through. Um, we did actually manage to get industry involved right from day one. They were defining the problems, um, they helped us recruit the students, they helped us co supervise the students, and they actually had to provide internships. I think internships are always quite a key component to developing any research workforce. To make sure that those PhD students don't necessarily quite so much retraining on the future, that they can actually start to produce very, very quickly. Um, so the projects that we were concentrating on, um, what I've got here is it's sort of almost a life cycle, I suppose, of shipbuilding in a, in a very quick and dirty way. So across on the left hand side is the basic materials and processes and designs and then uh, bringing it all together and operating it, platform acquisition and then finally platform sustainment. And underneath there are the um, uh, nine different projects down there and they're all feeding in at different stages. Um, by doing that, although it, it did mean that we had a which made it fairly difficult in a lot of different ways, but um, we were able to make sure we had that impact along the way. If you want to have impactful research, then multidisciplinary is about the only way you can possibly do it. There's no way you can do it on a single discipline, I think. Um, particularly in a shipbuilding sort of process. Um, the people, of course, are the main elements here that we're talking about, and this slide is, is a range of pictures here of the students in ECRs and um, the top right one there, um, we did manage to bring them together for a range of training. That's actually um, training all together in terms of presentation skills. We did that once a year, every single year, and actually uh, yeah. had a fantastic effect to bring everyone together and then train them. That's a teacher there, Barbara. Um, she's actually a drama teacher. Um, but in terms of presentation skills, the drama teachers are fantastic um, because that's their, that's their bread and butter. So that was all the um, doing that presentation skills. Um, and then the bottom left hand corner here, we did actually run a, a range of uh, presentation workshops over a range of years, bringing together a lot of different groups from groups such as Defence Science Institute, Defence Material Technology Centre, 
all these different groups that are related to the fence um, and practicing their presentation skills. And what you can see on the top left and the bottom right here is perhaps the fruits of all that labour. So the top left, you probably don't think you know that, that's actually a defence minister from 2019. I presented a prize to one of the students at the Pacific 2017 conference there. And down the bottom right here, that's actually our Chief of Navy, um, Vice Admiral Tim Barrett in 2016, where I got these three students, uh, four students, four students, four students to present to the Chief of Navy about their PhD projects. And the Chief of Navy actually came away thinking that's amazing. He didn't he ever believe that you could possibly get projects like that that are so applicable to the, his immediate needs, the, the Navy's immediate needs, and yet they're still progressing along the way. So, so those four projects um, really dear to my heart. They were, I was interested in all, with all four of them. The first one uh, was about fluid structure interaction modeling and underwater shock on future submarines. Um, so in this piece of research, we were able to genericize the research sufficiently enough to get into a PhD, because obviously we can't be um, doing PhD research on actual submarines. We did a, a pipe, what you can see there if you look very, very closely. Um, it's actually a, a generic pipe lower down into a defense facility and an underwater exposure facility, um, which is just outside of Melbourne um, in a place called Epping. Um, and what we did was, was literally put underwater exposures underneath this pipe that we finely tuned to get different kinds of resonances and, and look at the wicking with a, with a very generic kind of structure there. This was quite an amazing project. I remember in the kickoff meetings with Babcock, Defence Science Technology Group, and Australian Maritime College researchers, we managed to get a, a huge amount of uh, just free and open conversation because we were wrapping around this piece of education, this piece of very generic research. Um, from that, we were able to, to baseline a whole range of different projects um, and use the validation data and, and get that PhD. The PhD candidate here, Stephen McCandia, um, was working in, in the group uh, that I'm working in now, Defence Science Technology Group, um, but now he's actually <coughs> Um, industry. 
space as well. The last one um, was a student, uh, Sam Smith, oh, he's, he's not there now. unsteady loading of microflows. Uh, he was looking at the, the detailed investigation of unsteady loading of microflows of only emergency or partially footing in a with a, a flat blade boundary layer. Now this is very high end um, hydrodynamics design. Uh, it has a, a very large uh, effect in terms of control surface for submarines. So what the partners here were ASC, who built the, the Collins class submarines in Australia and maintains the Collins class submarines. Uh, again, the DST group and the University of Tasmania and Australian Maritime College. Um, here, I was the most interested in the, um, the finer details um, of <coughs> vortex generation and, and turbulence shedding from control surfaces similar to submarines. Um, we were then going to use that and have used that for data set suitable for comparison to sort of the large any simulations. Um, and we developed some scanning tools to recommendations for design to optimize control surfaces, design and minimum, minimize vibration and noise reduction from these control surfaces. <coughs> so, uh, Sam Smith now actually works in, in my group, um, so he's working with the Steve Green, the Science Technology Group, um, and he's doing hydrodynamic studies on a range of different vessels. So in, in broad terms, uh, government and academia necessarily have um, very different objectives. Um, bringing them all together though on a PhD program is extremely beneficial in terms of those projects that I mentioned there. We would never have gotten ahead. We would never have been able to do those experiments without the involvement of the events. Um, we would never have been able to do those experiments on unsteady loading without the involvement of the academic side of things. We will never be able to do those uh, experiments on tugs with our industry. But being able to bring them all together um, produces a, an amazing outcome um, in terms of training, collaboration, and the, the graduates involved with the cutting edge technology, um, training with industry and expected. Uh, the collaborations with uniting the industry, academia, and government, which is crucial to all events. In fact, all of those innovation bodies that I was talking about, they all aim to try to do that even more. Um, and we were able to, to build on the success of these collaborations. At the end of it, um, we did have all of our PhD students, they all got jobs straight away, mainly because they've done those internships as well. So what we did do, just starting to wrap up now, um, what we did do was make sure we had a look at the return on investment and analyzed some feedback from industry, here from um, defense, and from the Defense Materials Technology Center. Um, and we managed to get a whole range of different returns and investments announced by uh, acknowledgements, I suppose. So from industry, um, they did actually manage to benefit the research on their specific issues. Uh, potential IP creation, so that they could lead on from that, they could do those some background IP and develop it further. Um, mentoring and training, and training their future workforce. I think the future workforce is always the biggest thing for industry. Um, for defence point of view, so from a DSTG point of view, um, we could actually mobilise a hell of a lot bigger workforce than we ever could by bringing together industry and academia all at once. And the bigger the need of defence, research, the broader community could also be brought out by expanding out these generic sorts of research programs. But if you start to have a look at the commonalities, there's definitely always the collaboration that comes out. The industry sees it as close collaboration between industry. The defence, we see this ability to interact with more industry players on a, a much easier place to, to do research, I suppose. Um, and the whole of government sees the increase in collaboration and the university industries and government organisations. So collaboration certainly came through when you look at the, the different bodies involved. 
with the, with the research training centre. Then we also looked at the different people involved, so we've got PhD students, postdocs, the, the ECRs, and the university, the academic supervisors. And there's a whole range of different um, benefits there, but there's of course, even then, we start to see the collaboration really comes through to the fore, to the fore as, as the most beneficial side of everything, which is good. So every single partner seems to think that collaboration is, is certainly the best way to um, best <coughs> of such HDR, PhD research programs. So in conclusion, um, certainly keeping defence forces effective must have those TRLs raised, maintained and sustained and applied. And that's the, the biggest challenge of all in terms of any research organisation, I feel, is, is making sure that we can actually get those PRLs up whilst we're still maintaining that level of research as well. Um, research definitely needs people. Um, we've had uh, PhD programs in the past that don't necessarily focus in on that end product of the, the impact, which still does the research, but then the, the applicability of those people to the outside world is, is perhaps diminished. Um, research undergraduate internships. We use internships throughout um, undergraduate programs, using it throughout the postgraduate programs is just as valuable and perhaps even more appealing. And finally, just to wrap up, our research is applicable to ordinary commercial ships, just as well as sustainment, the um, design, the risk based design, the, the, the structural responses. In, in terms of whipping, and then finally, of course, the, the fluid dynamics and interactions is eminently applicable to the most of as well. So, with that, first let me I finish my discussion on, on HDRs and integration of defense. Global uh, issues uh, which uh, in 
equally applicable for over the place. So, so I am talking about that and uh, my, some of the points are already, I think, uh, related by Professor Jonathan with some example that we make uh, by Professor DC. So, briefly I will talk about the context, why we talk this topic today, and uh, why, why it's important for people tomorrow. The rationale behind this uh, 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 research, technology and innovation in the global issues. Then going to like some uh, uh, insight from these uh, three the areas, science, technology and innovation. Uh, and going to some details how we uh, need to align these uh, towards the final goal of creating uh, the sustainability. So that's it. And also I will come up with uh, some conclusions remarks, especially looking at the local context. I will touch upon the local situations where we are and uh, whether we are ready for the, uh, these uh, challenges, so facing these challenges. So that's what I am talking about. How many uh, you can expect it is all uh, not uh, any of you. This place we are talking about uh, the development, uh, the industrial revolution uh, basically has given many uh, benefit uh, to associate with development. Where we are now, our fundamental development is uh, technology uh, industrial revolution. However, uh, the same economic model we have been following. Now, uh, waiting for our development, uh, uh, especially with uh, the impact on the environment. So, uh, in that bracket, this is the present uh, economic model uh, we have in the economy, which lead to uh, all some kind of resources to face and environment degradation, local environment as well as the global issue like uh, climate change, which is supposed to be the most critical uh, <coughs> challenge in the time we see now. The upline uh, uh, the point is uh, these uh, issues are very complex and uh, uh, there are multiple challenges for sustainability. Then uh, how uh, we could uh, address this, this issue. So now we look at these challenges which are finally going up to uh, the issues related to the environment. And uh, one of the uh, key indicators of this uh, issue, uh, or to understand this issue, uh, comes in what we call these uh, planetary boundaries, which indicate that whether our biosphere or the environment is capable of handling these changes. So under that one, uh, globally there are some indicators or criteria highlight in certain areas whether we are safe for maturing the diagram, what is called the limit beyond political limits happening now. You can see that uh, if we are within the circle zone there, uh, we are safe. This is a safe region and most of the areas now, uh, you can see we are not in the safe region. And we have uh, low beyond that. For example, chemical pollution, for our uh, entities, uh, genetic diversity, then land system change, land damage pattern, even chemical flows, air pollution, those are as gone beyond the capacity of the biosphere. So that's where the assassin will come in and one of the key most uh, uh, critical challenge we are facing is the climate change. That's why uh, the lot of elevation of that one, the climate change uh, is the greatest challenge faced major implications, not only the environment, but also the human. So when you get this uh, issue, uh, the third complexity comes with uh, this challenge which are linked to the development, so should be development, which are too complex uh, for individual countries to uh, handle. Uh, but uh, this global nature of this issue also is a uh, kind of a opportunity for us to provide you know, Work together. I think we are collaborating so so highly and early by Professor Jonathan to solve any even research problem. We need a collaboration. So, the same thing here, this collaboration go beyond research group to talk to collaboration between countries. So, that partnerships are important. That's where this uh, global interventions came up, especially with the establishment of UN, United Nations uh, 1945, and after that, so many uh, interventions uh, which is happening even today. Uh, which uh, we can 
capture, especially looking at the sustainability agenda, which also uh, much linked to the environment issues. We start with the environment, now we are talking about more global one, and we can identify many institutions, even agencies like FAO, uh, then uh, UNDP, UNDP, many other agencies which are very active today as a global partner or the Europe partner are there. And especially in this context, like the today, because it's also the tomorrow's issue, we can identify key two uh, interventions happening now. Uh, we came up with the 2030 agenda uh, for sustainable development. Uh, other one is Paris Agreement from climate change. Both came up in 2015, which are effective now, I and mean, we target for 2030 with some speed targets. And, and one of the, and the most deliberated uh, uh, one is related to climate change. We have the conference of parties which all the government uh, leaders uh, are meeting yearly to address uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, it's also guided by, uh, that is basically part of the political scene at the political uh, arm, but also is supported by uh, the science-based uh, information provided by IPCC, uh, in the development panel for climate change. You can see how the research time is going into the policy making into this particular exercise. And, and, and we had this uh, of, uh, of 27, 27 meeting of this climate uh, change for global consulting last year in Egypt. But this year in November and, and December uh, of 28 is uh, scheduled to take place as uh, Dubai. And all the uh, leaders, even uh, Sri Lanka president, will be participating in particular this time. And now we have committed to what is uh, the NC road by 2050. And uh, there's a roadmap we open up and, and we just want to launch that roadmap in of 20. So that's one of the key kind of decisions uh, which uh, we want to present to the global community. So, but then of course there are many challenges. So, so therefore the present context we can identify two key uh, uh, convention agreement, uh, 2030 agenda uh, for sustainable development and uh, SDG sustainable development goals, where Sri Lanka is a signatory, so we have to follow up with that. And also we have Paris Agreement for uh, on uh, uh, climate change and also the implementation and mobility of climate change is particular national determined contributions. We have declared our contribution to this global intervention or the, the targets uh, that also we have to follow. That's a kind of a mentality, uh, uh, you know, reporting uh, uh, requirement. So this is different now and, and we are almost halfway to that. So 2030 uh, agenda for sustainable development, the next stages there are 17 stages covering almost all the type of uh, problems we face. The 17 stages cover the environment, five environment stages, five economic stages, five uh, the, uh, the uh, social one, and then we have two more which are related to uh, uh, the governance aspect, institutional parts. Other important come up with this uh, 2030, uh, sorry, uh, Paris Agreement. They have specific target, uh, uh, one basically uh, in scientific part, uh, you know, direction, uh, we have a, now we have limit the global warming well below 2 degrees centigrade. Presently warm is 1.1, we have only 0.9 there, but if we are here, 1.5 degree uh, uh, increase, which is not going to reach, really, but at least we have to try for uh, the uh, to uh, you know, the limit for the temperature goal, for which one of the mandatory or the essential requirement is to have is net zero uh, by this century. And most of the countries, including Sri Lanka, has declared that, uh, have declared that uh, by mid century uh, our economy and some of the sectors uh, will become, must become, uh, work towards that one to, for carbon neutrality and especially for energy sector. Our target is right when we have some carbon neutrality, I think, in the near tomorrow we go some of the interventions by CB and like. But this is a real task, and the government now come up with the roadmap for this net zero one, which is about to, uh, uh, you know, publish. But when you look at the progress so far, now these deliberations, although it's the documents came up, uh, agreement came up with 15, but deliberations are, uh, you know, you can track down even the case. But look at the progress. Okay. The recent progress review shows that we are far behind our uh, the targets. For 
series as well as uh, the uh, chemical. You, this is not due to COVID. Even before COVID, we are behind the, uh, you know, the, the map. And even Sri Lanka, uh, when you look at our SDGs, our European, out of 15, from 7 SDGs are far behind our targets. And then, uh, natural required contribution and temperature uh, targets we have. They are also uh, 20, uh, 22 hour processes behind our declarations. The one we have declared for the global community. So, therefore, we have a clear issue of how to go. Now, for example, in the NDGs, we have this now 70% target of viewers. Luckily, I think CBS now integrated that target to the long term generation expansion plan. It's a very uh, good initiative. But it's only late this year. But we have 85% more as with the other transport and industry, how to make it carbon zero, even the transport. Yeah, this is what we go by the vehicles, but they are very minimal human uh, equation so far. So we have huge challenges, uh, locally as well as globally. So with that, uh, the UN uh, Secretary General and the team came up with this what we call the decade of action in 2020 to 2030, which need uh, more uh, commitments, more ambition and more actions. So we look at the more actions, talk about the interventions which have to be guided by technology, the research and innovation. So we have our topic today, my topic today we are talking about this technology, uh, the research, technology and innovation. Clearly indicated that's one of the requirements, fundamental requirement to face these challenges. So therefore, rationale behind this uh, why the research, the technology and innovation should come. Uh, innovation perspective. Uh, some of these uh, the, the problems we are facing cannot be, these are solved, we cannot cater by only research. So we need urgent solution, we need innovation for that concept. Innovation will, is a requirement to make uh, suitable technologies that can cater for these challenges. So we look at this whole, it's a very complex thing, but then there are ways of uh, analyzing this complex issue to come up with a complex solution, which basically provided by, in fact, we get the agenda for sustainable development that talk about this economy, the society and the environment. What I show there is basically, Usually we do research by looking at the economical aspect. You know, to make aspect basically maybe transport, maybe energy, maybe urban agriculture, maybe cities. But then we have to understand that the economy has an impact on the society and the economy and the society has an impact on the environment. And this particular diagram shows in the SDG or the sustainable development concept that the most important aspect is the environment. Within the environment we have the society, within the society we have the economy. Yeah, this is the way of uh, re-looking at this economy, environment and the society in a hierarchical uh, frame which is the most important thing we are looking at the environment. Then the society which then of course the economy contributes to the economy the other thing. That is shown here, but this also indicates that it's a very complex thing. If we do a project which is related to as a transport which is a part of the economy, we are looking to its impact on the society and also its impact on the environment. So therefore, that's the kind of multidisciplinary aspect all the process of the indicated. That is a complex problem. And therefore, we have to have a comprehensive solution to tackle this complex problem. So therefore, this uh, numerous sector interactions, multiple stresses, uh, complex system are thus among the key results of the human dominance in the biosphere. So our persons our development pattern has created this complexity for so complex situation, complex challenges, and we have to come up with a solution for that. But that's where the science, technology, and innovation become the pathway to do that. So, so these uh, issues are, uh, when you can key uh, aspect of these issues, first thing is this is not a business as usual things. Business not as usual. You can't go along the path we have taken so far. Business not as usual. We are trying to innovate the pathways. Number two is a transformation in nature. You can't have just incremental changes now. We are too late to do that. We have to have transformation changes. In the energy sector also, we are talking about energy transformation, all the sectors. These are fundamental guidelines. Every instance, the situation are changing. Multi, the many uh, places, multi sectoral, and there are interdependencies. 
So that the compressing can, that therefore we have to follow a complete circulation approach to interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary and process effort. I think also you have also indicated to some of these experiments. The other added complexity is that remember that we are talking about issues locally, maybe nationally or locally, which is different from the global situation. Although the famous are developed globally, we have to handle with the local context. So therefore, when we find the solutions that mandatory, essential that you should localize it by looking at the particular circumstances, by looking at the national priorities, by looking at our resources, our expertise, our competencies, we have to adopt it. That's the most difficult part. Most of the time we fail without looking at the local context to try to implement some of the, uh, you know, the intervention which uh, is a very successful story elsewhere, but it will not work locally because we have not localized it. That is very important to understand and do research how you localize it, how you can contribute the local development or national development to your research. So there are solution part is basically there is no other way we have to follow the science, technology and innovation, you know, the team. Science uh, research will provide the information, the data and information to develop technologies and also support innovation that can lead to the activity, the response of the action for sustainable development or any uh, intervention we need. So that's the basic part we are talking about here, that, that, that therefore where by looking at this complexity, we can see that your science, the role of science, technology innovation is uh, very important. But another important thing you have to understand is all these complex, these interrelations and interlinkages provide opportunities, the windows of opportunities to tackle this problem uh, through uh, you know cross uh, sectoral or cross cutting areas. By addressing energy issue, we can tackle the power. So that's the important aspect. So of course the complex thing, but that provides us to for the researchers, for technical developers to solve this complex problem by understanding these interlinkages. We can solve power and energy together with this. That's the approach we are looking to. That's where this multidisciplinary team team to come. So that when we go into the science and technology and innovation, we have to understand the function of this. It's not just doing the scientific research, it's more beyond that. The key functions of uh, uh, these uh, three areas, science, technology, innovation, of course the creative and sharing new knowledge, creating knowledge, building competencies, meeting competent people or competent actors, creating collaborative networks that also was uh, uh, highlighted. How important the collaboration side, we have seen some examples, how the public sector, the university, the government and other get together to solve the problem. Uh, we have been providing finance, establishing governance and the regulatory environment and creating markets. Finally, we have to have a business case. So that's where the research is to look into that aspect. So it's a very broader uh, aspect to be considered when you look into the research for, for the technology. So basic uh, outcome, the scope of outcome is that we have to have a uh, evidence-based uh, decision making for actions, for interventions, for programs, based on information, those are generated by data. But remember that having data will not create knowledge, data is raw data. Uh, to eat, we have to put the data, that's what the information. Then the policy maker, decision maker should use that information for the uh, uh, creating the uh, conducive environment and implementing programs. So that's the scope of uh, basic scope of uh, science, technology and innovation. And you can this one is finally going down to very fundamental areas which we can even map locally that we have it, but for knowledge management. This is a knowledge cycle, knowledge development that can happen in, uh, in uh, research, but then knowledge sharing and knowledge application. That's where the research will go to the technology and technology deployment and so on. Uh, then uh, we need the key competencies, four competencies. We need competent people having these competencies. The, the learning to know the knowledge, learning to do the skills, and learning to be is the, you know, the values or the attitudes. All are, should be uh, there for us to enter this issue. And finally, the knowledge asset would be that three for again, we need competent uh, 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 the personnel, the actors, 
compare to its half in all the levels, static level, operational level, all should be competent enough to do their work. Secondly, the learning organizations, our organizations should be what we call the evolving organizations. They should change into circumstances. Then finally, to inform society, knowledgeable society, that who comes from our young, knowledgeable society should be there. All these three is required for us to go forward. You can just map Sri Lanka where we are for along this line, whether we have competent personnel, whether we have learning organizations, whether we have informed society or knowledgeable society. We have all areas we have yet. So the model basically is a complex of course, uh, but systematic uh, uh, one uh, where we can move from science innovation to technology development, uh, develop, development and deployment. Uh, which uh, basically involves step by step process. Sometimes this might take uh, in some uh, cases like maybe uh, pharmaceutical industry we are talking about 15 years of life cycle. Some other thing maybe 2-3 years like even ICT can be 1 year. It depends but it's a long process usually. It has to have scientific research, development, demonstration, market formation and diffusion and so on. That's where the technology will from research to the final level. Now to that, as uh, also Jonathan indicated, we have to technical with uh, you know, the uh, readiness level. That's a very important indicator that's also come up with that one. So I'm going to use uh, one of these uh, indicators later on. Uh, but uh, uh, in terms of scientific research, uh, when you get the, uh, the sustainable development and climate change as the key uh, topic here, you can identify uh, three key categories of research. You can also look into your research and see which, which one you are, uh, you are looking at. We need a research to first understand the issue. Without understanding the issue, you can't solve the problem, right? So therefore, one type of research is to improve the understanding of this issue, the economy, society, environment, system, climate, and their characteristics. Then, once you understand it, we need the research to support the action, the program, what you call the effective response to uh, sustainable development challenges, so action for sustainable development and to support these two for research and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the access we need tools and methodologies uh, to improve both understanding and action. So those are the areas to uh, which where you can identify many many different researchers. So only issue that when we talk about this uh, technology and innovation from research, we have a huge big issue that with this complex process, when you move from the research to final product development for dissemination on the ground, we have what we call the value of death. Maybe 99% of the research will die there, it's dying in Sri Lanka especially. These are not commercialized. You can find uh, this uh, type of uh, information, uh, but just don't highlight that. Research will not provide the benefit directly to society and industry. We have to have technology, we have to have dissemination, commercialization and so on. So that during that state, due to many, many reasons, one is my hand, there may other things are there. Due to that, uh, this research will end up in a maybe a cell as a report, will never go into the society. Now, how to make it that? I've already uh, shown that in some cases, for the donor that it's, it's workable, they have shown that. And, and especially for university, we need what we this example, technology license is set up, for example to convert research to a product and then commercialize it. Uh, so, technology readiness level has become from impact uh, NASA. You know, we are already here. Uh, NASA is so developed in the 1970s for space science. However, this uh, is so complex that almost all uh, the countries globally, this uh, technology readiness level is now used to map where you are. I just want to show here. Now, when you look at the pandemic research, which I have to one more to then technology readiness. With this level, what we do in the universities can one or two, maybe three maximum. But you have to go to nine <coughs> to contribute to the society, to the industry. A huge process is there. It's missing in Sri Lanka, typically. Do you know, Sri Lanka, we have local uh, patents to 24,000 patents. And out of that, only a handful of patents are here in the pump, unfortunately. 24,000 to 28,000 that's all. Nothing new. Patent will not just go to the people. So we need this whole process. So this type of, uh, as a research,
researcher, also if you do research, try to map, do research, where you are, see what you have to do. Along the way, we need a collaboration. You can be sure you are not an, you know, this really happened in our, our image. They come with a writer uh, and they want to do the research by themselves. That's it. No engineering. Next day they want to have a research. So we need that collaboration. That's where the university is. I think uh, maybe we have this technology license center. In Colorado, we have an enterprise for uh, oh, it's called university research UK center. The Canadian government uh, uh, the university they have that one. And then uh, they have the government uh, the university they have that one. But then of course it's not very operational. So we need a uh, university research UK center and a technology transfer center in a university to you know uh, convert this research to a valuable product for our own people. So the value of that will happen and most of the research we do at the university will end up uh, nowhere basically. But you might get a promotion because we publish it, uh, that's what you do usually, but nothing will happen to the society, the industry, that's why we are in Sri Lanka what we are facing now because of that. So we are also a bit of that. Uh, I just want to end up with some uh, indicators. Uh, to map where Sri Lanka is according to this uh, particular requirement. I think one of the things we talk about innovation, so we have after intervention, uh, what's called uh, global entrepreneurship index. Uh, you can see number one, according to 2019, we have completed one category. Uh, uh, so the US is number one, they are this of the circle. You can see all the areas, uh, they are performing well. Uh, look at the, uh, the national and regional, uh, sorry, uh, the regional and global averages. The black one is the local one. You can see uh, there are many areas where we really get the most important, the lowest mark is for human capital. We talk a lot, say that we have very educated people type of thing, but we don't have people who can do work. We have knowledge, but not the capacity to do work. So we have to, our human capital is very low. Technology absorption, we say that in going to data, we say that Sri Lanka, but we have the equipment transfer. Not the technology does. We bought equipment here, then they was already there, you know, outside. It's not us. Even internal from this that, you know. So, we, so that's the issue. Then uh, process innovation, we are very good at uh, product innovation. You can see in the paper. Uh, so that's how the mark what we have IMR product innovation. And uh, we need competition. So we look at paper, you can see there are a lot of every day. You can see a paper like we need this global competition. Good for all the paper. So you can see those who need higher mark, but all the other areas, we don't have you know, the situation are very, very weak. Networking, that's another thing, the partnership, we are very weak. We start up skills, not there, and of course, opportunity perception, so also not there. So we are very big in uh, innovation. So how to uh, you know, go forward? The innovation is an important thing, that's one thing. I also want to skip this, uh, what is the energy transition index. We talk about the energy transition now as part of the key to sustain the development. But this is the map of the energy, what is the transition index of different countries. Sri Lanka also map there. I just want to highlight global context. Sri Lanka comes under the category of uh, country with potential challenges. It says that, of course, we have a good performance, especially like the LCC, our focus are good. The system problems are not bad, but we are not ready. Transition readiness, we get low mark. And the lowest mark, you can see here, is for human capital. Again, lowest mark, only 20 plus mark out of 100 for human capital and also the state for the NDA. They are the partnership, for example. Like we, we don't work with the private sector, the other you know, agencies, we don't. Get the stakeholders onto the, the scenario. Institution and governance, low mark. Institutions, governance, we have low mark. Capital and investment, of course, we have a funding issue. Infrastructure and innovative business environment, all are very mark. So it's very low. I say that our conclusion here is basically we are not ready for any chance. That's what we are talking about. So with that, I will uh, just uh, conclude. Uh, so there are challenges, many challenges for sustainable development uh, climates, yet the solution frameworks are provided by global uh, agendas and conventions. Uh, uh, this 
some holistic and comprehensive, but we need to be localized for the uh, for to implement at local level. SDGs and very, very specific goals demand transformational and systemic changes across all the sectors of economy uh, and society trust the science, technology and innovation are <coughs> Moving from research and innovation to technology, development and deployment is essential but highly challenging task of Sri Lanka as it is uh, a loan access to exhaustive process requiring a wide range of enabling environment, resources, distance and cultures which we really lack unfortunately. That's my final uh, conclusive remarks. So, thank you.
in the academic sphere, we can certainly push a lot more resources towards it if we are publishing papers, if we are getting students, if we're getting more students through. But then that's the sort of the currency, as it were. Um, <coughs> industry wants to actually develop ideas. So, I mean, if you want ideas, go to industry. Industry has got endless ideas and things that may or may not work. But there's so many ideas out there in industry. And what all they really want to do is try to test the fact to a certain limit. So, by bringing that all together, concentrating on the, um, the, the, the benefits of each sector and the skills and the, um, the strengths of each sector, I think that's, that's always the key to it. Um, latching in with education is a, a massive um, resource boom, as it were, because by educating students, that's, that's the currency of a, of a university, that's what universities do. And that's how we can earn money and become a person. So as long as we, we wrap up with some education, then we can uh, release a whole bunch of resources. Um, I think there's lots of different options there. Um, it's not just trying to get the bank money. So, so, so that, that research project actually had zero dollars specifically from the banks. The banks specifically were all, they weren't banned from putting money into it, but it didn't count. So, so it, it actually didn't actually have money specifically from the so it had other things like that, um, the explosion, underwater explosion facility, uh, that was an in-kind contribution, so the banks was running an underwater explosion facility, and no one else was going to run that, and so, um, and we used it, but we, there was no cash inside. That answers, yeah?
right, thank you so much. Um, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for uh, thanks to uh, Professor and the, and the faculty and the university for having me here, uh, and to my uh, fellow speakers here on the panel. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about sustainability, something so important to, to uh, uh, the, the uh, country, and the earth, and the world today. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about sustainability on the largest scale in terms of the, the, the uh, long scale preservation of the earth. And, uh, Humanity's role on it. So to put this in context, uh, if you go outside at night, sometimes you look up at the sky, you can see uh, some stars up there. This is the, the uh, uh, region uh, called the Orion Nebula. Uh, if you zoom in, you see the Orion constellation right here, and you can see this from Sri Lanka during the, during the winter. If you zoom in a little bit more, uh, you see the uh, well, this is the, this is the Orion Nebula right here. You zoom in on that, and you can see, uh, you know, this is a picture I took from Mumbai a couple of years ago, and you can see some stars there. You can see some gas. You zoom in on that a little bit more using the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see more details in the gas here. Zoom in a little bit more, these stars are getting bigger. <clears throat> Move over to the side, you can see. Actually, what we see here is maybe solar systems. So these are solar systems, like this one up on top. It's a solar system just like our own, uh, but further away. It's a star in the center, and there's a ball of gas and disk, uh, dust and gas going around it. And you zoom in on it, and this is what it looks like. And this is what our solar system used to look like four and a half billion years ago. And so it was, a, it was a disk of gas and dust. And that dust and that gas was colliding and growing up to make the planet. And so the solar system was born with collisions. And you can see these here where you go from dust to pebbles to stones to rocks to boulders to planetesimals to planets. And that's also due to collisions. And you build the, uh, things from the smallest planets like Pluto to the biggest planets like Jupiter, all through these collisions in the solar system. If you look at the moon, you see evidence of this right in front of you. And you see all of these things on the moon these uh, giant uh, craters there. These are craters not caused by volcanoes, but they're craters caused by impacts with comets and asteroids onto the surface of the moon. And you can zoom in on them, and we can see it all over the place. The moon is covered with craters. And what that means is the moon has been hit by comets and asteroids over the course of billions of years. And if the moon has been hit by these things, then the Earth has been hit, and Jupiter, and all of the planets have been and so uh, these, these, uh, these giant impacts affect everything in the solar system. This impact is made uh, when you have something which is coming in fast. In fact, it's coming in at uh, you know, maybe 50,000 kilometers per hour. And it's essentially like a hypersonic bullet that the energy dissipated is mostly not from the object itself making a hole, but it's from all of the energy dissipated uh, from this hypersonic object coming in hitting the moon or hitting the sun. So it's, like, it's essentially like, the, uh, like an atomic bomb blast going off with all of the energy there. And you can see these all over Earth. So if you go to the US, uh, you can see a, a, a crater in Arizona called Meteor Crater. It was made about 50,000 years ago. Uh, if you go to India, you can see Maharashtra. Uh, you can see the Lonar Crater, which was made about uh, five lakh years ago. Similar songs. This one is now filled with water, just because it's rained afterwards, but when it was originally made, it was, uh, it was not filled with water. Um, it's got some temples and so forth in it now as well. And if you look around the rest of the Earth, you see hundreds and hundreds of these impact craters all over the Earth. Now, many of them are filled in because if you look at the moon, you don't have erosion and wind and continents and um, you know, rain and glaciers to wash them all away. But if you look at the if you look at the Earth, you can see them all over the place. And the oldest and largest, one of the oldest, one of the largest that we see, is in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's, uh, it's called the Chicxulub Crater because it's near the town of Chicxulub. And uh, we believe this is what caused the extinction, which killed off the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So this is a very large one. So the impact was maybe 10 kilometers across, and, uh, and it came into the atmosphere. And it made this crater 300 kilometers across 
that cause uh, fires, cause dust, cause global dust storms, blocked out the sun, and then killed off the dinosaurs. And we don't see this crater. If you're walking around, you don't see this crater. But if you map out the graphic, uh, like this upper map here, uh, then you can see the, the rings from this crater that are, that are still there. And you can see the geologic evidence of oh, sorry, the mineralogy of what's there, some stuff which is made by the high-speed shock. The moon was probably also made in an in the impact, where the Earth was hit by something four and a half billion years ago, or four billion years ago, which, which uh, skewed off material, it went into space, and, uh, and uh, formed the in this impact. So everything we see around us is made by impacts. This isn't all of the past. So in, uh, in 2013, there were drivers in uh, Chelyabinsk, Russia, uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning, and they noticed this going across the sky. It's a giant fireball, and it uh, was lighting up the daytime sky in Russia. And so this was caught by many, many hundreds of security cameras and dashboard cameras. It looks like a comet. It's not a comet. This is actually something which is entering the Earth's atmosphere. Comets are far distant away. This is an icy bottle about 30 meters across. It was entering the atmosphere. And so uh, motors could see it. And uh, they could see it passing through as it was getting burned up in the atmosphere. And we see this over and over and over again uh, in these uh, dashboard cameras. So I've got a couple, couple of videos here to play. And so um, this is something, this is not detected before it came to Earth. It's smaller than what we, what we can detect. Um, we can detect some, some large objects. And then as it's coming through the atmosphere, it burns up as it's slowing down. And uh, you can see the tail from it right here. And so, I was excited to see this, but there's also many uh, consequences of it too. So there's the there's the fireball of it that you see, and then you wait because the speed of sound is the speed of air is less than the speed of light, of course. What's going to happen? Well, everything gets blown out here, and so you had this situation where uh, people just living their lives, and then you hear the explosion from it, and uh, so. Over and over again. And you had the impact of this happening across uh, across the Chelyabinsk region in Russia. And so, uh, in the end, it was almost 2,000 people who were sent to the uh, sent to the hospital. A lot of them were people in the schools uh, who had seen the fireball come in. They went out to the window, and then uh, the impact from the blast shattered the glass and uh, and injured hundreds and hundreds of people. And so, uh, due to all of the, this is not the first time, of course, this has been seen, but this was the largest and best recorded uh, object of this size that had ever been seen. And it was best recorded because we had hundreds and hundreds of these security cameras that were, that were monitoring it. And so, we can triangulate and see where this thing came from, and have a pretty good, pretty good sense of it. This is the largest asteroid to hit the Earth in the last 100 years or so, the best observed one ever. Um, it's it's uh, probably a 30 meter body that had exploded something like 30 kilometers above the Earth. So it didn't hit the ground. I mean, some pieces of it hit the ground, but not most of it. Most of it exploded essentially as an atomic bomb in the, of, a, you know, of this size in the, in the atmosphere. Um, and then uh, we didn't know about this beforehand because it's too small to be seen in, in space, uh, too small to be detected. But what this, what this did do is really raise, raise the interest and raise the awareness of the potential uh, threat to sustainability of the Earth from these, from these impacts. Now, this is not the first one which has ever hit the Earth. In fact, if you go back 100 years earlier, also to Russia, uh, there was a much larger impact which hit Russia, called the region called Tunguska. It was about 50 or 100 meters across, so several times the size of this Chelyabinsk impact. And uh, we don't have any movies from it, but we, what we do have is photos of the crater and the trees in the region which were flattened in 1908. And so the Earth continues to be hit by 40 tons of material every day. Most of this is stuff which is left over from the creation of the solar system. So this is natural. This is not something which is uh, you know, created by humans. It's not caused by the things that we have done. Most of this 
is in tiny, tiny grains. So if anybody has ever seen, seen a shooting star, you've seen the same thing as these impacters here. A shooting star is about going to be one millimeter across. And as the shooting star enters the Earth's atmosphere, it burns up at nighttime when you're dark adjusted. You can see that shooting star is that one millimeter flame going across the Earth's uh, sky. So these impacts are going to continue. Uh, sometimes we see the rocks that are, that are caused, uh, caused by these, sometimes we don't. For instance, if you are walking in Antarctica, Antarctica's all made of ice, and so you're walking along the surface of the ice, and Antarctica gets ice, 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 no mountains, no volcanoes, and you come across a big black rock. Where did that big black rock come from? It probably came from up in the sky, so it's probably an asteroid or comet, which it, asteroid which it, which it uh, hit, the, hit the surface of the Earth. So we actually have uh, NASA and the National Science Foundation in the U.S. have expeditions to go down to Antarctica and uh, study, collect these, these, ast these uh, uh, asteroids and meteors, meteorites and uh, collect them and study them to learn about the, uh, the origin of them and where they're coming from and the history of the solar system. So we can make a plot of these. Uh, so if we, you know, we have the smallest bodies over here on the left, we have the largest number of these. So this just shows you the Diameter on the right hand side, the bottom here, versus the number over here. So we have the largest number of the smallest bodies right there. So, and uh, we can put the Chelyabinsk impactor on there. The Tunguska is more rare and smaller, so we can plot that. Um, the, the largest impactors which kill us the dinosaurs uh, are on the far right hand side there, the things which are very rare. Um, for scale, we can put something like an atomic uh, uh, explosion up top there. And so these large ones, so, so how, do we, you know, how do we address this problem? Because, um, you know, just in this one, we, uh, we got lucky that no one was killed, but we came very close. Because if the Chelyabinsk Tel impactor would have gone over Colombo instead of over rural Russia, then it could have been a very different situation. So NASA has telescopes which can search for, for many of these. The largest bodies, which are 100 meters, 200 meters, kilometers across, these are easy to find. Because something which is 200 kilometers across, we can see that with any telescope. And so those are very easy to find. Um, they're on predictable orbits. They're not coming in from space. They're not painted black. We can find those pretty easily with, with telescopes. Likewise, the things which are super small, these are like you know, shooting stars and fireballs and pebbles. And those are small enough that they're not really very dangerous. And so it's just these things in the middle, which is like, you know, big enough to cause some damage, but small enough to be hard to find, which is really the, part the threat to sustainability on the Earth. And so, um, so in, this, in this area right here, those are the ones which are dangerous and not yet detected. And so uh, NASA has programs to search for these dangerous objects, which not yet detected and, um, and put in place uh, methods to protect the Earth from it. If you look, all these things are coming from the asteroid belt. Uh, the asteroid belt is the region outside of Earth, outside of Mars, but inward of Jupiter. It's kind of like there's a missing planet in there. Jupiter's gravity's kind of messed up things a little bit, and so, uh, so there's a lot of the, all these asteroids can't, can't stick together and make another planet because they're disturbed by the, by the large gravity from Jupiter. And so every green point here is actually an asteroid. And so there's on the order of a million or so um, detected asteroids, half a million or so detected asteroids that we know about in our solar system. Here's the Earth orbiting, here's the inner planets, and all the asteroids out there. Now, we fly spacecraft through the asteroid belt all the time. It's not as dangerous as it looks to this plot because uh, this is not to scale. The actual points are smaller than what's, than what's shown here. And, you know, if you, if you think back to historical movies, you think as you're going through the asteroid belt, you know, this is from, this is from uh, The Empire Strikes Back, and you think if you're going through the asteroid belt, you need to dodge these things, and it looks like this. Um, and that's, uh, it's not exactly what it looks like. Um, in reality, the asteroid belt is pretty empty. And so you can walk back and forth in the asteroid belt a million times without running into anything. It's not like it is in Star Wars, OK? Um, and so that's why we've sent plenty of spacecraft dozens or hundreds of times through the asteroid belt uh, without ever hitting an asteroid. You're not going to hit an asteroid by, by running into it. But if you have the big Earth 
and you have the big Earth sitting there close to the asteroid belt for tens or hundreds or thousands or millions of years, you're going to get hit by stuff eventually. And so, uh, um, so if you want to detect these things, how do you, how do, you do it? So we, we have a bunch of telescopes, and you know, basically, if you, if you point a telescope at the sky, you're going to see some stars. These stars are in fixed positions like the constellations. You know, I showed you Orion, and Orion has a nice uh, shape that we all know and love, and because uh, and it has a, a belt of three stars. And that belt, it rises and sets in that shape every day. And so if you take a picture of the constellations, and then you take it again a day or an hour or a week later, and something's changed, you know that the thing that's changed is not the stars, but it's something else. It's a planet or an asteroid or a comet which has come in. And so this, this photo here, you can see uh, you know, in the purple there, that's uh, one asteroid that's moving across, the, moving across the sky. You know that thing's not a star. Everything else there is a star, but the thing that's circling is an asteroid. So that's what we're interested in. And so uh, NASA has a program called the Near Earth Observation, uh, Near Earth Object Observation Program, which has led the effort to find and identify all of these objects which are big enough to be dangerous, but small enough to be uh, uh, not detected yet. And so we're working on detecting these things within the last um, 15 years. We've found almost all of the things down to a kilometer, and, uh, and we're kind of working on cranking that size down. Um, and so we can do some statistics on, on what the expected risk to sustainability on the Earth is. And so how many people know someone who's been killed by an asteroid? Raise your hand if, like, your neighbor's been killed by an asteroid. Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Right answer, right answer. No one, to our knowledge, has ever been killed by an asteroid. There's been one dog. There was a dog which was hit by an asteroid from Mars, actually, in, like, 1898 in Egypt. Um, and so the average number of people killed per year is, let's, let's call it zero, okay? Um, because none of us know anybody. So the recent number is zero people per year killed by asteroids. However, let's think back to the dinosaurs. That happened, the, the, end, the extinction of the dinosaurs happened about 65 million years ago. So let's assume that we have an asteroid that hits the Earth about statistically every 65 million years. If every 65 million years or 70 million years you, uh, you kill off all of the Earth, the Earth has about 7 billion people on it now, so 7 billion people every 70 million years, you can do that statistic. And the average number of people killed is 100 people per year. So it's, it's, a, it's strange statistics because it's very low probability, but very high impact. But this is one way to look at the statistics. So low probability, high consequence event. Let's compare that to other things. Like, OK, malaria. Malaria kills 6 lakh people per year. Uh, <coughs> commercial airplanes kill you know, perhaps 100 people per year. Sharks kill almost nobody, but we spend a lot of money and interest in protecting ourselves from sharks. Uh, we spend billions and billions of dollars a year on air safety every year. And so it makes sense that there should be some sort of investment in protecting the Earth from something which integrated over the long duration has, a, uh, has an expected uh, uh, impact uh, larger, than some of these other, larger than some of these other things. And if you think about it, we've got, you know, the Earth is affected by a lot of natural disasters. We've got cyclones, we've got wildfires, we've got tsunamis, uh, as we know, earthquakes, impacts. Of all of these things, you know, we can do various things to protect ourselves from all of these. But impacts are the only ones which we can prevent 100% ahead of time. Because if we know that something is coming, we can actually develop the technology to go ahead and move it. With an earthquake, there's nothing we can do about it. We cannot prevent earthquakes, and we cannot predict earthquakes. But asteroid impacts are the only natural disaster which humans can predict and directly prevent. So how are we going to move this thing? So let's say that, let's say that we find, we have a telescope, and we, we uh, uh, detect an asteroid that's coming inbound up to the Earth. So we have the Earth right here. And uh, here is orbiting the sun, and then we have an asteroid which is also orbiting the sun. And if you see that that asteroid, it's kind of on a path which is which is crossing the Earth. So we call that a, a 
potentially hazardous asteroid comes across the Earth. And every year when it goes around, the orbit is about here. Every year it's, it's going to cross the Earth. Its orbit is going to change a little bit here. And so its, it's orbit kind of recesses. And so the first time around, it, it, uh, it misses the Earth by a little bit. And then you wait in the next year, and uh, it's going to get a little bit close to the Earth. And then it comes around again. And then finally, three years later, there we go. And you got the impact right there. And so usually, the, this is kind of how it works. That you have a couple of years of, of, of uh, warning ahead of time um, before an asteroid crosses the Earth's orbit. It's not that something is coming in from another galaxy and is on a beeline to us. That's not how it works. But it's slowly its orbit percent changes so that it's crossing and, and impacts us. So what do we want to do in that case? So okay, so let's say that we see this happening. Um, let's put our spacecraft up there. And uh, we detect this asteroid and this, this orbit is out there. Let's bring our spacecraft in and push the asteroid by a little bit. That changes its orbit so that it is no, oh sorry, um, so that its orbit is no longer uh, crossing the, the Earth's orbit. One thing you don't want to do is call up Bruce Willis. Uh, this is the movie uh, Armageddon. And what he did is he took the asteroid, blew it up into a, into a, a billion different pieces. Then you have a billion different pieces which are, which are then potentially uh, on unknown orbits, which could themselves be dangerous. So knowing what we know from telescopic observations, NASA in the last couple of years has actually implemented a test project to divert an asteroid from Earth. So this is called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. This is a spacecraft mission which NASA flew uh, last year. And this is a, the first test of an asteroid deflection technique by impacting a spacecraft into an asteroid. And so what we did here is, um, um, this is, uh, we, found it, we found an asteroid. Now this is an asteroid called, um, called Dimorphos, orbited by, it was actually a binary asteroid. So we had one in the center called Dimorphos, and then there was something called Didymos, which is orbiting it. And these are asteroids which are in the asteroid belt. Now this is an asteroid which was not going to hit the Earth. This was not a dangerous asteroid. This whole thing is a test mission, okay? Um, but what we did is we identified this asteroid, we designed a spacecraft, pictured right there, those are the solar panels on the side, it's radio and cameras and so forth. And uh, we designed this thing and launched it from Cape Canaveral. Um, and, uh, uh, and send it up to the, to the asteroid, and then the, the, uh, the, the spacecraft broke into two pieces, and one piece, the heavy part, actually impacted the asteroid itself. And the other one stayed around to measure how much, it was in, how much the impact changed things. And so this is the first time we've actually done this, and, uh, and our intent here was to be able to deflect the asteroid and then be able to, to measure how much we can actually deflect that asteroid by. And so, uh, uh, you know, this launched in 2021, it impacted uh, Dimorphos um, just about a year ago, uh, uh, later on this month. And so we had the DART mission, which was in doing impactor, and then this uh, observation uh, spacecraft called Lisa Q on the side here was actually um, uh, observing it um, after the impact to detect its new position. And so, um, chain, we impacted it, we uh, end up changing a, the period of it, and we can, we can, we, the way we can detect how we change the period of it is uh, we just measure how long it took this small asteroid to go around the big one, and we knew that if we, if we impacted it, it would change its orbit, that changes its orbital period, we can change its speed and its distance. Uh, we detected a, a change of 73 seconds in its orbit, and so that means we successfully, uh, successfully impact it. We measured <coughs> this from the ground as well. And then uh, for science, what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to uh, see how efficient we could transfer energy and transfer momentum to this, to this asteroid. And that depends on how big the crater is made and how much material is spewed off. And it's, it's something you have to go out there and measure to understand how it works. You can't just do it from, uh, from modeling and simulation. And so, um, let's see here. Um, so this is the uh, this is the, the launch <coughs> of the spacecraft that was launched in uh, November 2021. Um, this is an actual picture of when we're releasing the spacecraft. Uh, 
and it's, uh, this is the uh, sun, I think, in the background there. And uh, we're releasing the spacecraft, and it's, and it's headed toward the, uh, the Dimorphos, Dimorphos asteroid. Um, it's ejected from the launch vehicle there. And Dimorphos is a very small asteroid, and so uh, we didn't see it until we were getting really close to it. But uh, it got bigger and bigger and bigger as we were getting close to it. And so let's just watch that movie. So here we are on the spacecraft. Now there's two asteroids that we're going to pass. This first one on the bottom is Dimorphos. That's the small one. This spacecraft is running autonomously. So it's using, it's taking video with its cameras, and it's processing that using software on board. So it knows to skip this one and not, not uh, go toward it, and walking onto this one and targeting it. So here we are, so we're heading toward Dimorphos. See boulders on the surface. And that's the final image. The final image wasn't transmitted fully because that's the time of impact. So I think it's so cool to see that. So we successfully, uh, in fact, I'm just going to, uh, okay. So we, uh, so we successfully impacted, impacted Dimorphos. And we were able to watch this from Earth as well. So uh, this thing moving along the center, that's Dimorphos. It's being watched by a, by a uh, telescope on, on Hawaii. And uh, so there you can see the plume of material just coming off of it. You can't see the spacecraft itself. The spacecraft is too small. But what you are seeing is the asteroid, which was hit by the spacecraft. And you're seeing the plume right now of material coming off. seen from one of NASA telescopes. Um, so this is a global event because this is something to protect the globe. This is something with, which uh, NASA is working on with international partners also. This is intrinsically a really international event, even though this is, this is uh, primarily a NASA mission. We have a lot of, a lot of international partners who are working with uh, doing observations and support of this, uh, of this uh, uh, project. And so we have observers all around the Earth uh, who, were, uh, who were observing this impact able to study the ejection, the debris, and the, uh, how the light from the asteroid changed, the motion of everything, uh, as the impact evolved. And so we see uh, images here from, from uh, all of the, all of the from several of the different observatories, um, different countries working together to help NASA and help the world understand how these impacts work and how they affect the Earth. So this is a test mission. This was not a dangerous asteroid, but this sets the ground for NASA and other agencies to be able to protect the Earth from asteroids like this in the future. So, in the future, as we understand uh, the asteroid population better, and if we are in the position of having an asteroid which is directly headed towards the Earth, then we have the capability uh, to understand how to, uh, how to redirect these asteroids. So these impacts are hard because the Earth was made from impacts, the solar system was made from impacts. Um, so much of the geology and history and everything that we have on the Earth is due to uh, impacts beyond the solar system. But we're now at a level where, uh, where humanity could have threats to its sustainability from impacts. And we are, for the first time, at a place where we can control this single natural disaster uh, which could happen on Earth. We have a lot of asteroids um, still to discover. This is a problem which is definitely still open, so we need to do a lot of science from the ground. Uh, and we need to do a lot of stuff, uh, uh, work with telescopes to understand the population of asteroids. And then a lot of engineering work, um, working with NASA and with other space agencies around the world to uh, try to observe and understand how to protect the Earth. So I urge you to, uh, to follow what, uh, what NASA and other agencies are doing. Sri Lankan scientists, and Sri Lankan observers, and uh, Sri Lankan astronomers and engineers can contribute to this mission in the future. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tu, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, for, for the sake of uh, saving the time, let me move on to the next person's presentation straight away. Uh, it's, uh, Engineer Salome Marwadu, uh, who is uh, graduated uh, from uh, University of Marwadu with Masters and Bachelors 
Uh, he is currently working as a project manager in Ceylon City Board, where he manages critical transmission projects and building infrastructure. His achievements go beyond his professional role. He is a chartered engineer uh, with the ISL uh, and uh, a member of the Institute of Electrical and Thank you very much for your time. Actually, Dr. David was excited to be gathering with Dr. Ryan and Mr. 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 Ryan.
this clean engine by James Watt. But at the beginning, we used steam engines as a technology, the steam, the technology, and all as a fuel. That was about 300 years ago. But as a Sudhaka Paul said, so we constructed our first all energy power plant in 21st century after 300 years. But the coal power plant are now. The petroleum came into picture in 20th century, about 100 years back. Petroleum is the oil and uh, the energy like uh, uh, things, the, the uh, fossil fuels. So uh, that is also a costly option. So unfortunately, uh, today, in the last few months, we uh, use about 40 percent as percentage uh, of generation by oil. I think that is the highest in this. Why? But we are always talking about LNG, liquefied natural gases. But uh, we have to go to carbon neutrality in, 1950, uh, in uh, 2050. And we have to go to a 30% renewable target in 2030, but we were not able to develop our LNG infrastructure yet. But it is, should be, it should come soon because it should be a transition fuel until we go to 100% renewables or power energy. Uh, Nuclear came in uh, mid 20th century about 50 to 70 years back and in the old days we used only uh, hydro as a renewable energy. If you look at this, the history, the coal we had about the global as a main uh, fuel option 300 plus years, petroleum only 100 plus years, now coal is facing out. The petroleum is high cost option, so we have to go immediately to LNG as a transition fuel and to new RE. Now we are in the new RE. So nuclear came in about 50 years. I think, I mean, obviously we are going to have some large renewable projects and as Tomar uh, would say, the size of the uh, new plants that we are looking at, I think the number, 4,600 uh, solar and 1,100 wind. So right now I am doing a presentation in the UK, thanks to the technology, and I was telling practical numbers, so that's why I knew numbers. Uh, and these challenges are real. Uh, I mean, the planners, uh, Together with me, the one big guy is doing this presentation, and he was one of the great planners we had and lost to National Renewable Life Therapy in the US, so he's quite a good thing there. But uh, we had a very good plan. We did a great plan, but every time we do the plan, something else comes. So this is why this, why we are not having a renewable, sustainable energy system until now. It's, uh, it's a poor planning, not from CP side. Definitely, CP is supposed to be follow the guidelines published by the, the government or its ministry. And that plan guidelines are keep on changing. So, we will need the national guidelines. That is where I should That is once we have the national guidelines and we make them firm as. So, uh, how very correctly said, we will have a sustainable electrical energy system in the country, but we don't know when that's the question. So, with that remark, uh, I also need to, yeah, uh, I need to just point out to the audience 
in Sri Lanka there are 1.7 million customers who are consuming less than 30 kilowatt hours. So even though we talk about this large, you know, talk about 30, 70, 70% uh, renewables so maybe having a cost of 5.6 US dollar billion, this you know, make a large number of consumers well below the electricity poverty line. So we have to first solve that problem. Before we talk about solving the, the you know, issue with the you know, sustainability. So that you know like that. So there are a lot of challenges in this sector. So with that let me hand <coughs> over there's an element over there who wanted to ask questions. Sir, I have a three question. Uh, first one is why we can't implement a system, variable uh, payment system for small power producers. Like for a peak time, if we can implement a system for a highest payout, the, uh, after some times, uh, for a small power producers, mean uh, solar energy, they will implement a small scale uh, power storage system. So, if we uh, implement a variable uh, payout system, they will, produce, uh, they will output the power in the peak time. Yeah, there were five of you, sir. That's been a, uh, in the daytime and the peak time, so different tariffs for solar yes. producers and uh, who came to come in that place, no? Yes. So I actually, we are also proposal that we see, I think it's a proposal, is it? Because it was not approved uh, by the cabinet because of because this, this crisis in last years. So you know that the panel prices and battery prices and power prices were fluctuating now. So the person was went to went to cabinet, when it's gone that uh, the, the, the developers said that they can't do uh, the developments for those prices. Then cabinet uh, asked to uh, say another proposal, I don't know that we are it has uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, so I have not uh, much can be uh, so, so. If we can do it again, if we do it with time come, around 3 to 400 megawatts producers will be there with the, like today they are around 600 megawatts solar, uh, group of solar, mm -hmm. like that if, the, uh, if they are opportunity, the people will make a small scale uh, storage in their homes and they will those who have capacity, they will produce in the peak time. Yeah. It will be reduced the burden for the CD. And yeah, actually. So, it will be, so, we have a problem 10 years ago. So, even this small scale or large scale or whatever. So, I have been done with 10 years, the previous actually. So, so we have uh, 7 million customers. But, uh, out of the 7 million customers, the rooftop solar we have only Less than 50,000 rooftop solar. That means less than one. Less than one. So, so people, so that is not because of our technical problems or some other problem. That is our capacity. We don't have an investment capacity, as the officer the said. So, we have to work on this. So, investing for solar system is not, uh, not easy. So, we, we, we think that a lot of people have solar systems now. Less than one percent of our customers has solar systems. So out of those uh, 50, uh, 50, 50,000, two thirds industrial and commercial customers. Only about 15,000 of commercial customers are there. So only about 15,000 solar systems are there in uh, domestic homes. So so that means uh, so with group of solar. So technical issues uh, we can accommodate, but we are in last uh, few uh, years you know that we have more allegations, CDP, so we are not supporting them. So that's why. There are very few numbers, but we are they really can uh, try to uh, highlight it. But uh, the actual problem is not that uh, as what we said the people don't have the capacity. So with going with the uh, battery storage. You think without batteries, 
only panels, only one person had them. So we have given the net briefing, net accounting, and net class three, three, three schemes to uh, come into our system. In, the, in South Asia and in Asian countries, no, no other country like Sri Lanka who has offered uh, such schemes. So, but only one person has gone. But so you are, you are, you are, so I, I am not discouraging these uh, uh, people who are trying to come to that list. So the time should come, okay? That uh, and uh, we, we should encourage these people. But uh, it is not a solution. It's a big problem. Uh, 
control the power infrastructure using the commercial internet. No, not for controlling the power. I mean that whatever, whatever the information coming from home cannot reach the, the you know whatever the place using the commercial internet network because that sense. No, I, I mean other way around, sir. When you are generating in the night, you are doing very less cost. So you are publishing for a public for IP. The cost is in the night. That is the problem. Public IP doesn't work. There. That's the problem. Nobody, no power utility wanted to get into a public network to communicate. That is nowhere in the world doing because there could be cyber attacks which can hamper. Because there was a very famous case, somebody came to a site, you know, a normal public network and uh, stopped the power plant. So that can happen easily. Sir, so, so that's what we can control. I mean, from the CP side, they are not getting the details to inside the CP. Instead of they are sending the details to customers. One way around, they, no one can attack. From the CP side, they are sending information only. The customer side, they will... Uh, when there is an information flow, yes. you know, how the guys are clever. Do you, do, do you think that they can hack the system backward and do something? No, sir. That is, that is happening earlier. So, the CP is pretty, pretty careful about hacking their network into the public network that not see any unit in the world. So nobody is letting you have to be very careful to use the public in the communication network with the, uh, the, the power network, unit network to make sure that there is absolutely so you can implement. There are cases where they have implemented and I'm sure C V is looking for that but end of the day. That cost somebody has to pay. The cost will be around uh, 2 million, sir. Whatever it is. Uh, the, the system by the companies, you cannot discriminate people and they only buy the cost. So, so it has to go to somebody. I think uh, we can probably go to the third question and close the session. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> any, any one more final question? We are talking about technical level. Nine. There are so many skills we have to follow, including safety, regulatory aspect, and so on. So that's why we ask them. So therefore, don't think that we have an idea you can get it in the case. So there are no things that do. Regulatory standards is a good talk. Please give it to me. Yeah, last question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The uh, people getting soft information and leaders uh, of the industry, uh, university, and the government. If you see the Rahman area, the university want to work, and we are also working to more tech and reform of German tech and all that. This is the thing is there. The country is leading, and the industry country is leading, the industry is sending people to the government also supporting, but Rahman does not support that much the country's economy. So we should get together and uh, what we should do is now the pillars are building up, isn't it? Pillars are building up, countries uh, yeah, representing very good, but the linkage is very thin. Arrows are very thin, industry to academia is very thin. So we still keep the arrows in thin because if you go for our long term strategic level, the corporate bank, corporate bank, much of the stuff is building the pillar, not the arrows. So I'll be on the right path, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, so basically, like we talk about cooperation and example, like university, industry, government, pharmacy, that's the key. Um, so that is not that uh, environment is not there. Even more basic, we have the university business in case and whatever is the price. We have all the innovation and so on. And we, one of the using technology, technology. So we still be a you don't have budget. You need the university, our own academic structure, we do have to, we, we don't have to do business. We are doing business. Business is not for university, that's the concept they have. So the way we feel we don't have culture for innovation is enough. Even though family, I know that Dr. Rayata Kondo Sabaya, 
तो पेरेंट्स ना आप देखते नहीं हैं इसे बहुत कोई लोग बैंक में बहुत बुरी चीज़ है दे आर वेरी फ्यू को रियली को ये हम राम में भी पेरेंट्स साथ से इतने बहुत नोस वेल रियली एक्सेप्ट ये हम जीरो ना कंपनीज वो दे मार्मी मार्मी ये इंडस्ट्रियल सो दे आर आर the partners in the team, the industry don't trust us. So we work in a different kind of state. Industry all the results in the market. But we are talking about the PAT or something which we get three years, four years. So we have to have that understanding. We have some niche to that. For example, the industry is sponsored by both states. They are not any kind. That works. So there are, we can say, that's why we are going to be a green team. We can look at the world, but we have to find a local solution. That's a local solution for it. I think it's so much to have these collaborations. But uh, many don't like it. If the academic area is in comfort zone, and uh, I have discovered within my department itself to promote it, uh, probably Santa knows that. Uh, even I can't drive my department because the way it is happening is different. We are in comfort zone. We have to break that. We are in a crisis situation. It's a war. But it's still here and you know, it's a conference. It's a conference. That will not work. We have to break this. We are in a break. That we have to understand. But it's only going to collapse. We have to act now. But no one is taking that leadership. Someone has to sacrifice. No one is us. We have to sacrifice. We are somehow bad dog, good dog, you know. We are there now in this crisis. You can't run away. People are running away. It's happening. Unfortunately. But there are, of course, there are people like the other guys trying to do everything. But it's a minor thing. We don't have medical mass to drive this relationship. So, like one thing I'm saying. The culture is also there. We have to we don't talk to each other. SM is by the way, in fact, I usually work with SM. They are very surprised that most of you see guys come to their, you know, the black child industry. They didn't believe that, you know, though. They think that we are more by the human system. So a lot of gaps are there, so we have to support SM and so on. And we have to get paid at the university. Even department don't work. Even within the department, we have our own groups. When we are in a cell, so I see that we were there today, for example, we were sharing a single table. Single table, for example, we were talking about the same thing. That's the way we were trying to be in the department. Now, we have a department. This will not work. The partnership between us, with the university, that's something, that's what we are saying, that we can start with. Let's, let's try it. Thank you. Thank you. I think we probably now close this session after a really interesting and commentary for presentations and enthusiastic crowd, which is sometimes lacking in our audiences, but here I was so glad to see that the crowd is in therapy. I am not trying to discourage that gentleman over there because I have to be in another place at 4 p.m. but I am still here at 5 p.m. Uh, so that's why I was trying to close this session. So I really appreciate the four speakers who gave a uh, you know, tremendous effort to educate us in uh, very important four areas and for the audience for your uh, patience uh, right through and your questions and my uh, reporter who has been quietly doing something next to me uh, so thank you very much
professor Tushar Bhattacharya. Professor Jonathan Chadwick, Defense Science and Technology Group, Department of Defense, Australia. Thank you very much for your active participation. Hope you have a nice day.